season's all right. Now I have to share with you, I'm just compelled to do this. So please don't throw anything at me. <laughs> but do we have a friend of ours? And he's quite a jokester. And he said, well, someone came up to him the other day and said, oh, well, what's going to happen in the new year? And he said, I don't know, I don't have 2020 vision. <laughs> morning in the bulletin, I know that a number of times that I've been here always at the top, it says that, uh, you know, that you welcome both myself and Donna, which you always do, and uh, kind of give you a little bit of my background, and uh, it says that I've worked, uh, or served on the board of directors of Healing Springs, and uh, I retired from that as of the end of the year, so that's changed a little bit, um, but it's always been up there, and one of my uh, greatest passions is healing. So I thought this morning I'd kind of address that a little bit. Um, there's four questions I'm going to start with before that you might ask me before we get to the scripture and the, and the sermon itself. One is, how did you get involved? Two, have you ever been healed? Three, was the, when, when was the last time you saw a healing? And fourth, why isn't everybody healed? So the first one was in 1970. I'm showing you how many people are in chuckling the young people, going, I was never even born then. In the spring of 1970, we had a new pastor come to our church, um, in the Methodist Church uh, in North Chatham, and uh, he was in his latter 40s, he and his wife, and they had four grown children, and they came in the spring. In that September, or the latter part of August, she was diagnosed with cancer. So they, she was going to go through some kind of radical treatment, and so he decided we were going to get together, a group of us. He had some, his four kids came home and their spouses, and there were some people from the church and then some other churches that he had lived around the Capital District area. And we got together in his living room. I don't know, there must have been 20 of us. And we were going to have a prayer meeting. So we had a prayer meeting. And there were no lightning bolts. Um, nobody fell on the floor. We just prayed together. I was actually... <laughs> I mean, in the time, I was really young then, and it was kind of boring, really. And uh, so we got all done, and we had uh, tea and cookies and coffee. I mean, you got to have that, right, church group? And uh, we went our way. It was a Friday night. Two weeks later, she went to the doctor, and she came back, and uh, the tumor had shrunk to some degree. So they were going to revise the, the treatment, and about a month later, she went back, and the tumor was small. And it wasn't shortly after there that she was declared to be in remission. And so I kind of got interested in this and uh, started to kind of look into it and what the Bible taught and whatever. So that was my, my exposure, my initial interest in it. Have I ever been healed? Yes, I have. Uh, as recently as a year ago, December, um, I had a left knee that was hurt years ago. And I had re-injured it and uh, gone to the doctor and this was like five weeks after the incident happened. And uh, he said, well, it looks like you're going to have to have a total knee replacement. Oh, great. So we were at Molly's, or oh, sorry, Nine North. And uh, <laughs> I had a knee brace on, and Jake looked at me, and he'd come back from a mission trip, and he said, what's the matter with your knee? So I told him, and we were with another couple. And the uh, place was packed. He says, yeah, can I pray for you? Sure. So I figured we were going to go in the Molly side, or in the kitchen, right? So he, in the middle of the dining room, gets down on one knee. And I look at her, she looks at me, and the couple we're with, they're okay with it, so he starts praying for me. That was on Saturday night. Sunday morning, I didn't put my brace on. No problem. That was a year ago, December. When was the last time I saw a healing? last time I saw a healing was the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And I saw it go from Sunday until the Friday after Thanksgiving. And I, if you want to, after the service, I'll tell you that. It's pretty amazing. Why isn't everyone healed? That's a very easy question. Because we all aren't as tall and as handsome as Dick Fulman. <laughs> <laughs> I have very limited resources. I have no idea even after 50 years, why people aren't healed. I don't know. But I do know that God's in charge, and I've watched him, 
and he's done so many things. So this morning I want to talk a little about it from the scripture. I want to go to uh, Luke chapter 4. And I have a lot of scripture, but you don't have to follow me. A lot of it's in Luke because Luke is generally the gospel I go through during the month of December because of the, the way the Christmas story is in there. So as I was going through this, and Sarah, when Sarah called and said, I, could you possibly fill in on the 12th? And I go, oh my gosh, what am I going to use for a sermon? And it wasn't but four or five days later, at 2.30 in the morning, the Lord woke me up. And you know, we're great people, aren't we? Well, do I have to go to the restroom? Do I have to get something to eat? The last resort is, oh, you want to tell me something? All right, so I laid there and I laid there, and finally I knew I had to get up. So I went up and I'm in the office, and uh, Donna came in around, got up around 2:30, and said to me, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I got to get this down." So I know this is from the Lord, and I know this is definitely from the Lord because in the middle of the message this morning, the scripture is exactly what's on the front of your bulletin, and Sarah had no idea I was going to use it. So I'm pretty excited. About it. So Luke chapter four, Jesus is coming back to his hometown. Beginning at verse 14, he says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and brought, and news about him spread through the whole territory. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, and what were the praise songs that we sang this morning? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, two, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, three, recovery of sight for the blind, four, to set the oppressed free. And if you go through this morning and you find the Spirit of the Lord working in your spirit, you will fall into the last part of this that says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There is no greater place to be than in the Lord's favor. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we gather together, as we have gathered together, I just pray that right now your Holy Spirit would quicken our spirits, that we might grasp the truth of what it is you want us to have in our Christian walk. There is no cookie cutter situation here, no cookie cutter answer, but you will speak to each one of us because you have created us, as the psalmist says, fearfully and wonderfully. And help us to begin to see that this morning, Lord. And I thank you for the privilege of being and sharing and having your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want to look at, first of all, three healings in this gospel. The first one is going to be just a couple pages over in Luke chapter 7. Right in the beginning, Jesus is, uh, again... Out and about Capernaum, verse 2, there was a centurion servant whom his master valued highly. And that servant was sick and about to, to die. The centurion, now remember, this is not a Jew. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to ask, Come and heal my servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Well, that's a pretty good reason to kind of support this guy. He was given a little funds to the thing and some, some labor, and they had, he had a, they, we had a place to worship now because of this guy. But is that really what was going on? So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy of you to come. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For, and he goes on to explain who he is. <clears throat> and then in verse 9, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd, following, following him, he said, I 
tell you, I have not found such faith, such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Now here's my, my, my key. The servant wasn't anywhere around. Jesus never reached out his hand and touched him. And it wasn't because he had given all this money, the centurion had given all this money and all this labor and whatever to build this establishment. It was the fact that the centurion knew who he was asking. His faith was not in faith. His faith was in the master. And because he knew who the master was and understood what the master represented, he knew where the authority came from. And so he said, I don't even have to go there. I just merely need to make this request made known. And God knows my heart. And what happens? He, the, the servant was healed. Let's go over another page or two. Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 43. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a man was there who had been subject to, I'm sorry, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. Now, isn't it interesting that Matthew and Mark both say that she spent all that she had and she was not healed? But Luke, being a physician, says nothing about that. Human nature, huh? Anyway, side, side track. <laughs> All right. So, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Okay, so when we started out, it says the crowd is crushing him. They're all around him. Jesus says, who touched me? Peter says, Master, are you serious? The crowd, they're here, they're pressing around you. Jesus said, someone touched me. Power has gone out from me. The woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Did Jesus touch her? No. But she knew where the source of healing was. And she went there. She touched him. And isn't it interesting that in this relationship, Jesus never touched her, never really knew what was going on until the healing began. And then he said, Power has gone out from me. And the point to me here is this. It was the individual in the midst of all these people who was important to him. Every day I get up, hundreds of people call, cross my path to the point sometimes that you know, no, I'm not answering the phone. No, I'm not answering that text. No, I don't want to talk to anybody. And yet, every individual is important to Jesus. All right, let's go to Luke 17. Beginning at verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. That was what was required when you had leprosy. You used to run around and say, unclean, unclean. When he saw them, he said, now they're at a distance, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Pretty cool. He didn't touch them either. However, one of them came back, Praising God in a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was not 
a Jew. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, where not, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. You know what? There was a different dimension between what happened physically and what this man was doing. It says they were cleansed. They left. Jesus said, go to the priest. They were cleansed. That means they were healed. So what is he saying to the Samaritan that comes back? Your faith has made you whole. He came back with an attitude of gratitude. He knew who was the source of all this. And it wasn't just merely the words. It was the person. It was the Son of God. That's faith. All right? Let's talk about trust a little bit. Well, let's no, let's stay here for a minute. Let's go back to uh, verse, oh, let me see. No, chapter 8, I'm sorry. Chapter 8, the first part of it. Verse 22, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat and set out. As they sailed, a squall came up. The boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciple came and woke him. Master, master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. And then he said, where is your faith? Okay. Now, they had walked with him. They had seen healing. They get into the boat, and the physical extremities that are around him began to invoke their attention, and what happened? They had doubt. If there's anything that is counterproductive to the Christian faith, it is the fact that we continually look to culture and society when that is not the governing force that God wants us to be a part of. I said this morning when we began, the highest life form is in you when, G when Jesus Christ becomes a part of your life. God's Spirit. In John chapter 14, he says, My Father and I will come and make our home in you. That is your basis. All right, now let's talk about trust. Psalm 37, which is on the front of your bulletin this morning, which I think is kind of cool. Okay? Beginning at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and make safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you the de desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Now it starts out saying that you trust in the Lord. And boy, this is a good verse because right after that it says, trust in the Lord and do good. Alrighty, I can get involved. I can do something. I have to do something. But there's a semicolon there and it picks up and it says this. Dwell in the land. And if you don't know that, look at the front of your bulletin. Dwell in the land. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Are you delighting in what God has given you? My wife accuses me of not knowing how to have fun. <laughs> the other day she says, you know what? It's a new year and you're not smiling enough. And lo and behold, I sat down and I thought about it and she is right. And you know what? I, here's my New Year's resolution. Every day, some way, somewhere, I'm going to have some kind of fun. I don't care if it's reading my favorite book. I don't care whether it's rubbing the cat's stomach. I don't care whether it's talking to my kids. But I'm going to have fun. Because that is an element of the safe pasture. And he goes on. Commit to your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. And this is what He'll do. 
He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the noon day sun. You know what? You walk in that in trusting the Lord. There isn't a person in the world that can't see it. And that's what he wants. Now, let's go over to Proverbs 3. I know you're going to say, is he going through all 66 books? No. <laughs> all right. Five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. There's a good verse for me because just like I said, right away, I'm going to do good. That's what it said in Psalm 37. That's not what it means. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. Lord, why aren't you touching Jeremy to the fact that he's 100% healed? I don't know, but I've got to walk this path. And it's not crooked if I follow him and if I walk in him. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And here is the benefit. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Disease gets right down in there. And yet the Word of God says that we have an avenue. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the doctor because God gave us those too. But there's an avenue there that lets you live a healthy, whole life. Oh, you're blowing smoke. No, I'm not because when I got up this morning, I looked at Proverbs 12. Here's what it said. Exact anxiety in the heart causes depression. Now, that wasn't scheduled. That was just something I was having in my morning devotions. And I go, whoa, and I started thinking about that. And I thought about my own life. When I have anxiety in my heart, not here, but in here, what happens? Let me tell you something. You can get discouraged in the world. And then I started thinking about some of the people who are being treated for depression with prescription drugs and what they're going through. You know, he's got it all here. Trust in the Lord. Now I want to just close with one thing as far as trust is concerned and then we'll hit the last one and then I promise we will get done. In Matthew 14 and you know this one I'm sure uh, Jesus made disciples get in the boat, go on ahead of him while he dismissed the crowd. Then he went up on the mountain side by himself to pray. Later that night he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, and buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went on out to them. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. So he lets them know he's there. Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come on the water. Jesus says, come. And then everybody always gets down on Peter because he didn't, you know, he, he didn't make it the whole way. But it says next that Peter, and only Peter, got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. He had total, absolute trust that one, it was the Lord, and two, what was going to happen was okay. What's the next word? But. But. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him, and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Do I doubt that the Lord is going to heal my son? No, I don't doubt it. I don't know how he's going to do it. Because for every reaction, there's a reaction, if you will. 
the disease when und was undiagnosed for a long time, there may be consequences that come from that. I don't know. But I know one thing, with a number of people who pray for my son, and because of my faith and the faith of my wife, I know in some fashion, my son in some way will be healed. Am I of little doubt or little faith? Many times. And I'm going to share that with you right now. So we looked at trust, we looked at faith, and uh, I made light of the fact that um, the last question was, why, why, are, why isn't everyone healed? Well, I don't know. But I know one reason why a great many people are not healed. And it is unforgiveness. And this is not a good subject. Okay. If you were to turn to Matthew 6, this is what I heard when I left the house this morning. Oh, you're going to do an illustration? I said yes, and she goes, uh-oh. <laughs> In Matthew 6, and I am very reluctant to share this verse with you this morning, and I am not going to say much about it after I read it. Okay? Unforgiveness is one of the biggest reasons why people are not healed. And if you pray for healing or you're praying for healing and there's unforgiveness involved, the Lord will let you know. What you do with it is up to you. That's what's nice about it. He never pushes us, okay? Now, you're asking, what am I doing? Let me just share with you what we have here. We have, this is me. I'm not sure, but I thought Wally said that's the best I ever looked. <laughs> okay, and in here are a number of items of which I would term elements of unforgiveness. Okay, um, let's say that might be dysfunctional childhood, um, teenager might be an issue of abandonment, um, early 40s might be a divorce. I don't know, there's a whole bunch in here. They're yucky. Oof. Anyway, so they're in there. Okay, in uh, Matthew chapter 6 which you know is part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. The disciples come and they say, you know, let's teach us to pray, and we shared it this morning. We never go to the last verse after that prayer is over. So I'm going to share it with you this morning. For if you forgive other people, if you forgive men, if you forgive other men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What does that mean? I'm going to let you figure that out. That's a personal verse for you. Okay? Unforgiveness is one of the big, biggest obstacles, not only in healing, but in a Christian life. Now, listen to what Paul says later on in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. This is after Jesus has given his life. He's conquered death, come out of the tomb. The day of Pentecost has come. The first century church is well on its way. And in this letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. This is what Paul writes. Therefore, as God's chosen people, every time we go through a situation, I mean, it got pretty quiet when I read that last verse. Yeah. <laughs> but guess what? Right after that. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, that is, set aside, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So what is my illustration here this morning? Watch this. Forgiveness. I forgive. I've forgiven my parents for the childhood that I had. I've forgiven my mom for the abandonment issue when I was a teenager. I've forgiven my ex-wife. I've forgiven the New York Giants for not making the playoffs. <laughs> now, tell me one thing. Can you see where the hole 
Were those things a word? They're all, there's no hole, is there? What happened? The love of God is represented by the water in this tub. What happened? It filled it in. Now, I took all those things out. So you know what happens to me? I get up in the morning. I have my praise time. I have my worship. The Spirit of God comes to me and He pours His love, which now I have room for because I've gotten rid of the unforgiveness. Paul says that. Virtue of love binds us together. So what are you gaining by keeping unforgiveness? Nothing. If you give it up, there's a whole new dimension of God's love that becomes apparent in your life. Now, I know we're coming to the conclusion and you're saying, wow, about time. Luke chapter 4. Jesus, talking from Isaiah 61, says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he anointed me to preach good news to the poor. In 1973, the Methodist Church started on a program that we were going to abolish poverty. We walked hand in hand with the welfare program. You know what Jesus said when the woman poured the perfume on his feet? You will always have the poor with you. But because of who Jesus is in your life, you can share that with someone else who has no hope at all. I don't know whether they're physically poor or spiritually poor. But you can preach the good news to those people. Number two, to proclaim freedom from the prisoners. That's just what I illustrated. There is an point in your life when you give something up that you're hanging on. You have no idea what I went through, Ed. I don't. But he did. And his last words were, as he gave up his blood in his life, is, it is finished. Don't hang on to it. Well, are you going to tell me how to get rid of it? No, that's between you and the Lord. But mark my word. He will show you how to do it. Recovery of sight to the blind. We heard John Aldridge say yesterday that he had a high school friend who's going through a, a bout with cancer right now. And for 20 years, this man has walked away from his faith. His sight was spiritually right at one time. This says recovery of that sight. Is it John? Is it somebody else that's going to help him? I don't know. But that's there. The recovery of sight to the blind. And set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord. Now, why did I go all through that longer than usual? I for this two illustrations. There was the statistic let out. I don't know, probably three weeks ago. Warren County has the highest incidence of cancer in the state of New York. Don't you think that the people that live in the same county as I do need some kind of hope? And maybe it's a prayer of faith. A pair of healing. If you watch the news, and this, this really gets me, if you watch the news on Friday, you know that in Mexico, an 11-year-old boy went into the boys' room, came out with two guns, 11 years old, 5th grade, 